Chakra Saru. Kawaii! In the early 1960s, summer evenings on Evergreen Avenue in the Wanamasa section of Ocean Township were filled with the usual neighborhood sounds of that pre-video game, pre-helicopter parenting era. There were kids calling to kids, dogs barking, ice cream truck, bells ringing, and moms loudly demanding that their offspring get inside right now and wash up for dinner. But occasionally, there was one other sound that was unique to the particular little pocket of the Jersey Shore. The ear-splitting, thunderous wop 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 of Donald Reed revving the engine of his flying submarine. Yes, that's right. Donald V. Reed built a submarine that could fly out of spare airplane parts and scavenged scrap metal that included a steel bed frame and two galvanized metal garbage can lids. When he tinkered with this oddball invention in his side yard, friends and neighbors were drawn to the sidewalk next to his house like iron fillings to a magnet. Don Reed was a neighborhood celebrity. He had been on I've Got a Secret and The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. It was like living down the street from Doc Brown, the eccentric inventor played by Christopher Lloyd in the Back to the Future, only without the time-traveling DeLorean. When Reed built the first full-size flying submarine in 1962, he called it the RFS-1. At a time when Americans were eagerly anticipating the dawning of an exciting space-age future when every house would have a robot that would do chores tirelessly and uncomplainingly and kids would strap on jetpacks to travel to and from school, the idea of a flying submarine made perfect sense. It was the height of the Cold War and everyone was thinking about weaponry. If a submarine was good for sneaking up on an enemy ship and blasting it at smithereens with a torpedo, then a submarine that could deliver the death blow and then come up from the depths to make a speedy airborne getaway was even better. The idea of a flying submarine was nothing new. Leonardo da Vinci mentioned the concept in his writing and there was a flying sub in Jules Verne's 1904 book, Master of the World. The Soviet Union tried to develop a flying submarine during World War II, but the project was eventually shelved by 1965 when TV audiences who turned in the underwater sci-fi adventure series Voyage of the Bottom Sea first threw the sight of a stingray-shaped sub blasting of the ocean depths. The first working version of the RFS-1 was already three years old. The RFS-1 wasn't about to set any nautical speed records, but it did everything a submarine is supposed to do. Dive, turn, surface, and so on. The trouble came when it was time to craft to morph into an airplane. Its 65 horsepower four-cylinder airplane engine made it too underpowered to sustain flight to do more than take short hops above the surface of the water. Reed kept tinkering with this flying submarine, but his dreams of making a fortune by selling the plans to the Navy failed to materialize when the Military Invention Board dismissed the idea as impractical. He died in 1991 at the age of 79. Reed's family donated the RFS-1 to the Mid-Atlantic Air Museum in Reading, Pennsylvania. <coughs> Trophies have followed John Terry around throughout his career. The Chelsea legend won five Premier League titles, five FA Cups, and then famously the Champions League during his 19 seasons in the Blues first team, with success after success after success seemingly coming natural to him. His decision to don his full kit to lift the Champions League in 2012 despite being suspended for the final might be one that he regrets now, but one look at his trophy cabinet is all he needs to do to silence any critics. And after moving to Aston Villa, he wasted no time before picking up another trophy. It's just that it is a weird one. JT, the new Villa captain, obviously skippered his side of 2-0 win over the Hertha Berlin in Germany on Sunday, securing his new side, the Ali name of Cup of Traditions and Process. The massive trophy features a footballer bursting out of the ball, and with that couple with being his John Terry and Cup we're talking about, the internet <laughs> found it very, very funny. As you see in the tweet, Never change, JT. Never change. The new coffee shop on Caesar Chavez Avenue in Boyle Heights was busy and steaming Thursday afternoon. Busy because people seem to like its menu of food and beverages. Steaming because a vandal had smashed the glass front door and the air conditioner couldn't beat back the midsummer heat pouring in from the street. Reuben vibes of the Boyle High anti-gentrification activists have targeted Weird Wave Coffee just as they target 
art galleries have moved into the area. Protesters calling for a boycott of Weird Wave, flash signs with blank white coffee and Americana to go on Wednesday surveillance video showed someone in a black mask smashing the front door window. What a bunch of hypocrites and cowards. Internet found it very funny. Two undercover cops, one Mexican-American, came in to show their support. Marte Reyes, a regular, was greeted by the name when she came in for coffee. Everyone has the opportunities to work, said Adriana Gonzalez, who runs a travel agency next door to Weird Wave and stops by the shop a couple of times a day for a cafe con, crema, or mocha. Trying to drive out white owners in a case of too much racism, she said. Some merchants said that appreciate the business that might come their way with a more foot traffic around the coffee shop. And Christine Tours of the Boyle Heights Historical Society dropped by to donate framed photos of the neighborhood's early days. She said it was a way to welcome the new business which opened in June and to link the shop to proud history. The protest has a couple ridiculous aspects to it. First one, the three owners of the Weird Waves is Latino. And they came to the coffee shop idea and put the money to back it. Then they searched the entire city before finding a spot they liked. We have a five-year list, so we've got to keep going for at least that long. He said he tried to speak to protesters, but he didn't get anywhere with them. They didn't like to engage him. He said they just like to hate. The other ridiculous aspect of this dispute is that Boyle Heights has a Starbucks, and the activists don't seem to have a problem with it. Is there a more obvious symbol of outsider corporate established bigfooting his way into neighbors, driving up rents and changing the local vibe? When Christine Farmo saw the story on the broken window at Weird Wave, she drove straight to the coffee shop from her home in East L.A., marched up the counter and ordered a brew. She was livid and adamant in her support of Weird Wave. I've been in the neighborhood for 54 years since the street was called Brooklyn Avenue, she announced, asking why if the protesters care so much about the neighborhood, they don't do something productive like sweep the streets. As arresting as it may be, the Mexican mole lizard wasn't what shocked Sarah Ruan, a professor of evolutionary biology and herpetology at Rutgers University in New York, when she discovered one in a trap in mid-June on a trip to Baja, California to teach a course with the conservation group Island and Seas. I was digging around inside the trap, pulled this thing out and started screaming and shrieking and ran back the couple hundred meters to where the people we were with had camp set up and was just shot, Ruin told Live Science. Ruin said she was so excited because although Mexican mole lizards are abundant in the southwest Baja, California, these burrowing creatures are rarely spotted above ground. She initially doubted herself only because she considered a Mexican mole lizard some sort of mythical thing to find, she said. Neither snake nor lizard or worm, the Mexican mole lizard shares the suborder along with three other species of two-legged burrows. The creature has, in fact, inspired a dark story that haunts some people who share its stomping ground. It's said that the creature will wiggle out of toilets in the neither regions of unassuming bathroom goers. Aided by the suppository shape heads, the herpetologist Lee Grismer explains in the book Amphibians and Reptiles of Baja California, including the Pacific Islands and the Islands in the Sea of Cortez, Thankfully, there's no truth to the story, Ruin told Live Science in an email. In real life, Mexican mole lizards, which grow to be a bit shorter than the length of a strand of a spaghetti, 9.4 inches or 24 centimeters, restrict their burrowing to the ground. But because their tunnels are also the prefect proportion for small snakes, a scientist suspects snakes are the Mexican mole lizard's biggest threat. Luckily, the reptiles have a clever way to block hungry snakes they can self-amputate their tails on command. This might be a way to plug the burrow while threatened Mexican mole lizards make its getaway. Researchers speculate in a paper published in their journal, the occasional papers of the California Academy of Science in 1902. The problem is, since they can't regenerate their tails, the trick works only once. We work more than once a day, so you guys can subscribe and like and share right here on the Toro Taco New World channel. You guys have a great day and be healthy and bizarre.